All right, uh, we'll call to order the Pennington County Planning Commission meeting for February 22nd. Roll call, Commissioner Peterson is representing the county board and we are missing Commissioners Landers and Svenix. Uh, so it's kind of a small group today. We hope we'll all agree on things. Uh, approval of the February 8th, 2016 minutes. Has everybody had a chance to read those? Any corrections or additions? If not, Chair would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. I'm assuming to accept the minutes as read. Uh, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Approval of the agenda. Uh, there are agendas in the back of the room for those of you who are visiting us. If you would like um, to get a copy, they're uh, in the bookcases back there. Um, would anybody like to make a motion to approve the agenda? So move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. Uh, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The consent calendar. The following items have been placed on the consent calendar for action to be taken on all items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar by any planning commissioner, by any staff member or audience member for separate consideration. The findings of this planning commission are recommendations to the Pennington County Board of Commissioners who will make the final decisions. PJ, will you read the items on the consent calendar into the record, please? Sure. PJ Conover, Director, Planning Department. Item number three, conditional use permit review 0536 for Ronald and Brianna Hill. To review a bed and breakfast in a suburban residential district, staff recommends to end conditional use permit 0536 with the owner's concurrence. Item four, conditional use permit review 1003 for Gwen Zelfer. To review a dog and cat boarding kennel in a limited agriculture district, staff recommends approval of the extension of CUP 1003 with 10 conditions. Item five, conditional use permit 1426 for Patricia Tashetter to review a caretaker's residence on the subject property in a suburban residential district. Staff recommends to end conditional use permit 1426 with the owner's concurrence. Item six, conditional use permit review 1502 for Valerie Naylor to review an accessory structure, which is a garage and a pri um, prior to a primary structure in a general agriculture district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of CUP 1502 with six conditions. Item seven, rezone 1601 for Thomas Price to rezone 3.37 acres from low density residential district to suburban residential district. Staff recommends to continue rezone 1601 to the March 14th, 2016 Planning Commission meeting with the applicant's concurrence. Item eight, <coughs> rezone 1603 and comprehensive plan amendment 1602 for Mitch Morris to rezone 760.41 acres from general agriculture district to low density residential district and to amend the comprehensive plan to change the future land use from limited agriculture district to low density residential district. Staff recommends to continue rezone 1603 and comprehensive plan amendment 1602 to the March 14th, 2016 planning commission meeting with the applicant's concurrence. Item nine, conditional use permit 1601 for Daniel Elliott to live in an existing cabin while building a new single family residence on the subject property and to also allow the existing cabin to remain on the property to be used as a guest house once the single family residence is completed in a general agriculture district. Staff recommends to continue CUP 1601 to the March 14th, 2016 Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, PJ. Are there any planning commissioners who would like to pull any of these items from the consent calendar for further discussion? Uh, would staff like to pull any items? None. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to discuss any of those items further? If not, Chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent calendar as written. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. <laughs> and we go on to item number 10. Sure. Item 10 is rezone 1602 and comprehensive plan amendment 1601 to rezone 22.88 acres from general agriculture district to limited agriculture district and to amend the comprehensive plan to change, change the future land use from plan unit development sensitive to limited agriculture district. The applicant is Kevin and uh, Gail Thom. The agent is FIS Land Surveying and the agent is in the audience today. 
Again, the request from the applicant is to rezone 22.88 acres from the General Agriculture District to Limited Agriculture District in order to bring the proposed subdivision plat into compliance. The parent parcel, which you're looking at right now on the screen, is 119 acres on General Agriculture. Its um, future land use is planned unit development sensitive, vacant of any structures. The platting ends, it exists in the platting and septic buffers for, of the city of Rapid City. And there are section lines on the west and the north property lines. The proposed subdivision, which you see here in blue, is going to, is proposed to be lot C of the walled subdivision, is 22.88 acres, it is currently zoned general agriculture. Uh, however, with the applicant's uh, lot size request of 22.88, it would not meet the 40-acre minimum for general agriculture, hence the rezoning request to limited agriculture, which only has a 10-acre minimum. The future land use is planned unit development sensitive. It's vacant of any structures, and of course, this also exists in the platting and the septic buffer for the city of Rapid City. Currently, access is obtained through existing easements. The applicant also owns this property on the bottom left, um, so they would have the two lots in common, which would give him legal access to propose lot C. However, if the applicant was to sell the lot to the bottom left, which is adjoining. Uh, the applicant is prepared to create and record any easements across that property to gain and maintain legal access to proposed lot C. Um, in addition, the two section lines that I mentioned that exist on the west side and the north side, uh, the applicant is uh, prepared and has started some documentation to vacate the 60, well, 66 feet of that section line on the east and the west side, uh, going north and south along that western property line. I don't know if that's been filed yet, but we have reviewed some of the paperwork um, up to this point. The surrounding, whoops, went too far. The surrounding zoning within a mile and a half is general <coughs> agriculture, limited agriculture, low density residential, general commercial, suburban residential, and planning and development. And those lots um, in size vary from one acre up to 287 acres in size. Future land use in the area is predominantly uh, planned unit development sensitive, which is all that little kind of light yellow hashed area. And of course, the orange is suburban residential and the yellow is low density residential. The comprehensive plan, which you're basically looking here, that the applicant's looking to rezone uh, or to change, uh, the Comprehensive plan shows that it's plan unit development sensitive. However, the applicant wants it to be, or is requesting it to go to limited agriculture district, which actually is in harmony with the existing zoning in the area, just not in harmony with the comprehensive plan. Um, the way this area has been developed is basically ranchettes. And uh, though it has general agriculture zoning and limited agriculture zoning, and the pre predominantly it still has a uh, residential. So the applicant's request, though not in harmony with our comprehensive plan, is in harmony with how the area is being used. This request was routed through the interdepartmental review and no items of significance came up. Um, and staff recommends the approval of rezone 1602 and comprehensive plan amendment 1601 with no conditions of approval as all or and any concerns and requirements will be addressed through platting and or building permits. Thank you, PJ. You're welcome. Are there any questions for PJ? PJ, can you explain the uh, relationship between the applicant and the property owner? I do not know the relationship. Maybe the agent does. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple people who would like to speak on this. Janelle, would you like, since you're the agent, would you like to speak to this? I can just answer. <clears throat> I can just answer your question. My name is Janelle Fink. I'm with Fisk Land Surveying, and we're the agent for Kevin and Gail Thom, and then the property owner Alan and Leah Dewald. The Dewalds and the Thoms are neighbors. Um, the Dewalds live in the property, the little square where it says "subject," where that word appears. That's the Dewald home, and they own much of the surrounding property. The area that you're looking at that they're proposing to replat is pretty physically separated from the rest of the DeWald property. There's a significant dryer canyon, that heavy dark area you see there is pretty heavily forested and mostly draw, so it's difficult for them to access or utilize that. The Thomes are interested in purchasing that 22 acres. They'd like to build their retirement single living residence there, and so, that's the relationship and basically the purpose. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for Janelle? Thank you, Janelle. Would you like to speak, sir? Uh, 
Yes, I just have a, a you quick... Introduce yourself, please. My name is David Goodsell. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a brief comment. Um, I was sent a letter uh, about this rezoning, and this is a map that they sent me. Now, if you can tell where my property is from this map, you're a lot better than I am. And uh, I, I have no idea. I had to finally go down and get the pictures that they had. I wish they would send better information or better pictures. This is just a dark photocopy. So if you have any control over that, force the people like Fisk and some of the other people to send something that people can read and understand. I had to go on my, by myself down to the Planning Commission to find out where I was on this. Gotcha. That's the only comment I have. Thank you, Mr. Goodsell. I hope staff will take note of that. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak on this matter? If not, anybody interested in making a motion? I move that we approve our rezone um, 1602 and comprehensive plan amendment CA 1601 with no conditions. Second. <clears throat> Should we do these separately? Or PJ, would that be better for you guys, or does it matter? No. It doesn't be, matter? Yeah. Okay. It's been uh, moved and seconded to approve rezone RZ 16-02 and comprehensive plan amendment CA 17-01. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. On to item 11. Good morning, Cassie Bolstead, Assistant Planning Director. Item 11 is a conditional use permit request CU 1539 to allow for a recreational vehicle to be utilized as temporary living quarters on the subject property from May through September of each year in a suburban residential district. The applicants and owner is Bellwether Limited Partnership. The agent is Janice and or Roger Knudsen. They are in the audience today. Um, the existing land use of this property is vacant. Um, the way that this property exists today, it is located off of George Frink Road. Um, like I said, it is zoned suburban residential district. It's 0 0.91 acres. This property was platted in 1971. Um, the access off of George Frink Road is via a platted 20 foot wide private roadway easement. And George Frink Road as it exists right now is approximately a 10 to 12 foot wide gravel road. Um, there is a section line that runs east and west through this, through a portion of this property down here, this kind of yellow line is a section line. Um, it's currently vacant of any structures. There is a leveled area for, per, the purpose of it is for RV parking. There is an on-site wastewater treatment system up there. It was installed via an approved septic permit in 2009. It's a 1500 gallon poly holding tank with an alarm. There are two septic hookups, two water hookups, and an electric hookup up there. Um, to give you a background of where this conditional use permit came from, I'm going to run through a, a timeline here. So I apologize, it's kind of an extensive timeline. Um, November 14, 2006, the applicants purchased this property. Um, on, in August of 2009, the on-site wastewater treatment system was approved to install the, the holding tank. Um, the site plan submitted with this septic permit um, as you can see right here, does indicate that this would be utilized as a for a proposed RV site. Um, the site plan also indicates that the well that serves this property is located on lot eight, which is also owned by the applicant. Um, in 2009, the applicants did submit a conditional use permit application to allow a recreational vehicle on the subject property. This application was ultimately withdrawn prior to the request being heard by the Planning Commission. Um, staff is unable to locate the original 2009 application or any subsequent documentation of precisely why it was withdrawn. Um, but based on some of the research that staff has done, it is believed that it was withdrawn because an RVS temporary living quarters is not specifically listed as a condition use in a suburban residential district in our zoning ordinance. In July of 2014, there was an ordinance violation case opened citing an RV being utilized as temporary residence on the property without a conditional use permit. 
At that time, there was a violation letter sent to the property owner by the then ordinance <coughs> officer, um, Rex Fackrell, and a copy of that is included with this staff report. Um, in August of 2014, that case was closed with notes stating that Mr. Knudsen had contacted Mr. Fackrell and that the RV had been removed from the property and they would apply for a conditional use permit in the future. Then in July of 2015, another ordinance violation case was opened, citing an RV again being used as a temporary residence. Another violation was le letter was sent by the ordinance officer at the time. And then on August 5th of 2015, that case was closed, again stating that the RV had been removed from the property. Um, on September 22nd, that's supposed to be say 22nd in your staff report, it says September 2nd, it's September 22nd. <laughs> staff received a complaint letter from a neighbor stating that a personal RV had again been utilized on the property over the summer months um, and a violation case was opened there. On October 2nd, staff spoke with the state's attorney's office regarding the violation and at that time staff was advised that the property owner must obtain a conditional use permit to continue using the RV on the subject property. On October 5th, um, staff sent a violation letter to the property owner stating that they needed a conditional use permit to continue using the RV. Um, a copy of that letter is also included. Staff did also send a response letter to the complainant advising of the same thing. And then on October 7th, staff spoke with the agent Janice Knudsen, who stated that she would apply for a conditional use permit um, and that she would apply sometime in January of 2016. Then in October of 2015, staff received a copy of a letter addressed to the state's attorney's office from a neighboring property owner regarding the RV being utilized on the subject property and the response letter that they received from staff um, on October 5th. On October 16th, the state's attorney's office did send a response letter to that neighboring property owner, basically stating that it was still in our hands. It hadn't been sent to the state's attorney's office yet, but we had consulted with the state's attorney's office regarding the need for a conditional use permit. Um, in November of 2015, staff sent a follow-up letter to the property owner um, reiterating the conversation um, about applying for the conditional use permit and stating that an application needed to be submitted by January 29th, 2016. On December 15th, 2015, staff received 16 signed letters um, of opposition from neighboring property owners, along with a letter asking if a conditional use permit application had been submitted for the subject property. On December 18th, 2015 is when we actually received the application for the conditional use permit. Um, at the time of application submittal, the agent requested that the conditional use permit wait to be heard until this planning commission meeting as they were out of town for most of January and needed time to fulfill notification requirements when they returned. Um, January 27th, 2016, staff received another signed statement of opposition to the conditional use permit request. February 11th, um, staff tried to reach um, the agent uh, to answer some additional <coughs> questions and to also advise that a site visit needed to be performed. February 15th, staff did attempt to go up to the subject property. Um, I, since I wasn't able to get a hold of the applicant or agent, I didn't go to the property on that day because there were large tree branches across the driveway and since I didn't have permission to move them or drive over them, I didn't go up there that day. But I did observe that George Frank Road is a well-maintained 10 to 12 foot wide gravel road. Um, there is also a locked electronic gate um, on George Frank Road that you do need a code to get into. Um, it's right before you enter the the housing area where the subdivisions are. Um, February 16th, staff spoke with Mrs. Knudsen. She stated at the time they're unsure if a permanent residence will be built on the property. There's usually only one RV utilizing the property. However, at times they do allow family or friends to bring their RV to the property. Um, the RV they anticipate will only be used for two to four night stays from May through September and no more than two RVs have ever been on the property at the same time, um, nor do they anticipate their to be ever more than two. Um, February 16th, staff received another letter of opposition to the conditional use permit request. We also received a memorandum in opposition to the Knutson application for conditional use permit. Um, all of those are again included with the staff report. 
February 17th, staff did perform a site visit um, and found that the subject property is at the top of a hill with a steep embankment on the west side of the property. Um, so here's what the subject property looks like. As you can see, it's a leveled area. Um, the property appears to be clean and well-maintained. Um, a large area has been leveled for RV parking. Um, here's some photos of the hookups that are up there. As I said, there's two septic hookups. As you can see here, there's two water hookups and an electric hookup. And then there is a small fire pit, um, charcoal grill and picnic table on the subject property. This is a picture of George Frank Road at the very start of it. Um, there is a bridge on George Frank Road as well. Um, there's their fire pit. And then on February 17th, staff received um, a letter from the agent applicant in response to the complaints and statements of opposition that have been received and stating their intentions for the property, again, included in your staff report. So to kind of tie all this together, the applicant does own um, let me get back to the picture here. The applicant does own the two properties directly to the north of this property, this one here and this one here. Um, under Pennington County Zoning Ordinance Section 208, an RV as temporary living quarters is not specifically listed as a conditional use within a suburban residential district. However, there is the sentence in there that says the following uses are illustrative of those which the board may approve. Other uses may be allowed provided they are not found to be contrary to intended uses of the district under consideration. So through staff's consultation with the state's attorney's office, it has been determined that that verbiage allows the applicant to request a conditional use permit for a use that is not explicitly listed in a zoning district. And then the determination to allow that conditional use then falls upon the planning commission. Um, staff has been notified that there are more than one, to my understanding, sets of covenants um, that govern these um, subdivisions up here, including the subject property. Um, in this case, Pennington County does not enforce covenants, so covenants would be enforced through the Homeowners Association of the subdivision. This was sent through the interdepartmental review process. Um, two comments that I do want to point out. County Fire stated that they would need to obtain an address for the lot, um, which that will be assigned if this conditional use permit is approved. And they also stated that an open burn permit would be required for their fire pit, which is listed as a condition of approval. Um, County Fire did also have the question about what the placement of the personal camper would do to any land values. Um, staff cannot anticipate how this would affect any, any surrounding land values or anything along those lines. The County Water Protection Coordinator did state that there is no operating permit for the holding tanks that are up there. Staff did have a conversation with um, Mrs. Knutson regarding that. She said that she will have the holding tank pumped as soon as weather permits. Um, and per our zoning ordinance, they will also receive notification via mail that they need to um, have their septic system pumped. So um, staff does recommend approval of conditional use permit 1539 with 13 conditions. Thank you, Cassie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any questions for Cassie? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in a remote lot like this, um, what good does the alarm do on the holding tank? Um, that would be a question. Oh, I don't even think Brittany's down here. Does, um, that would be a question. For I'm, ju I'm just curious what that does. Yeah, I, I mean, if there's no one there. Yeah. Ultimately, the I'm not sure. The applicant might know what the purpose of the alarm is. I'm not sure. And then my question about the holding tank, too, is that um, I understand it was 1,500 gallons, and it's never been pumped? Correct. Okay. It's from the only, time it was constructed. Yep, from the time it was constructed. Um, it's only utilized when it's up there. Uh, when the RV is up there, um, and since the lot doesn't have an address, um, they wouldn't have received a notice from notice us to, stating that it, it needed to be pumped. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I have one other question, too. Um, did you look at other times when we have approved um, non-RVs or campers or something like that as a temporary residence? Yes. Because I know, I know that we have approved those situations. Mm -hmm. Did you find one similar to this? Um, I didn't find one necessarily similar to this in the sense that none of the rest of them have been in a suburban residential district. We have approved them, um, but they've been more in like general egg, limited egg. Okay. Um, I think there was even one in like low density. Um, the difference being that this would be a suburban residential district. 
I mean, because typically, and I don't have the best memory, but typically I remember people will ask to live in a, you know, an RV, a camper, a, a, a converted shed or something like that until they build their permanent residence. We've approved several of those. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that we talk all the time about treating people consistently. And I just wanted to make that point. Does anyone else have a question? I have a question. <clears throat> um, has there been any legal action under the covenants by the Homeowners Association against the applicant? Um, not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, make... Also, um, from 09 to 14, <coughs> was there any usage? I mean, we, we have the property septic tank, et cetera, put in in 09, and then we have a complaint in 14. So does that mean the applicant didn't use the property for that period of time, or do you know? Um, it's my understanding from various conversations that I've had that they did utilize the property, um, but just that a, a formal complaint was never filed until 2014, not one that was ever recorded in our system. So it took five years to, okay. Okay. Can I make one other comment too? Yes. I need to disclose that I had a telephone conversation with Janice Knutson, and I also had a personal conversation with um, an adjacent property owner's daughter it would be a Jean Grossenberg's daughter, Janelle Ferris. Okay, so. uh, I have a couple of questions, Cassie. Can you go back to the uh, picture that shows there are three lots? Uh, can you show me how they access that property from the road? I, I couldn't tell from the overhead. Yep, George Frank Road comes right down here like this, and then there is a road that comes, cuts across all the way up here. Okay, and who owns that property? You know where the this loop one? of the road is. No, the one to the north of that. This uh, one right here. Mm -hmm. um, that's on, owned by Game Fish and Parks. Okay, and they have an easement for that road. Yes, there is a. a that's a platted easement. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where on the lot is it that they park? Is it down by the point of the triangle? Yes, it's right here. This area, right here. You and that's kind of pretty far it. up above the rest of the neighborhood. Correct. Um, let me show you. I have a picture here that kind of gives you an idea of, um, here's the nearest residence. So you have to come up this hill, um, and this is looking down over where George Frank Road would be, um, and the Mickelson Trail also runs over there too. Okay, so is the RV visible from the nearest residences? Um, I. Uh, I don't know if it's visible from the nearest residence. I do know that I have been told that it is visible from the Mickelson Trail and from George Frank Road. Okay. When you come around that corner that you can see right there on the okay. picture. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Bill. If, if the uh, Knutsons were to buy a mobile home, mm -hmm. set it there, would they have to get a U uh, conditional use permit? Um, only if it was a single wide. That would that that would satisfy the the conditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, they could put a double white up there with just a um, building permit. Right. Okay. Is there uh, and are there any more questions for Cassie? Brittany's going to come down, I guess, and answer the question about what the alarm does. Okay. <laughs> Do you know, is it, a, is it a visual alarm? Is it um, a light or is it a sound? Is it a, <coughs> is there, it a shot down or something? Oops. If I can, oops, wrong way. If I can get to it, there is also, um, I would assume it makes a noise, but there is also this light right here. Okay. Um, a red and light. Brittany's here. Lori, would you like to ask your question again? Sure. Did, did, they, did they tell you what the question is? Yes. <laughs> For the alarm system. Yeah, what does the alarm do? The alarm system it um, is set up to go off, so it allows for three days of storage before it's full. So once that alarm is activated, it allows you about three days of use. But if no one's there, what does the alarm do? Because, it goes off. Well, because, okay, because <laughs> typically, you know, there's right. no one there. So right. if there's a light or a sound. Right. It would go off until someone but deactivated, depending upon how that's set up. Wouldn't it go off while someone was there? That's the only time there's any usage. Right. So well, it, it seems to me oh, it would be Okay, proper. so it warns you it's almost getting full. Right. Okay. So it gives you about three days. Okay. So whatever it was based on capacity, however many bedrooms or 
um, gallons per day, it gives you like three days of that. And typically, I mean, we've heard of people calling us and going, our neighbor's alarm is going off and it goes off for, until someone shuts it off typically, so. So it's a sound alarm as well They as can be, or it can be like a light inside the home. It just depends. I believe these are, uh, um, I'd have to look at the thing, but I don't see like a light or anything. I'm, There's like a little red light right here. Oh, okay. But maybe, you know, in this remote lot, no one may see the light or hear it. Right. Unless they're, they happen to be there. And, and then just, just, to, just so you can clarify it um, or, or verify it, this has never been pumped from the time it was installed, right? I don't believe so. We didn't find anything on that. I'm because, not again, because as Cassie said, it didn't have an address, so they wouldn't have gotten the notices that people typically get to do Correct. it at some frequency. Yes. Or, and it, would, and it so, wouldn't have been inspected. Or, I believe that was a condition. Yes. Was it? Yes, it's yeah. a condition of okay. the. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions for staff? Yes, Commissioner Peterson. Looking at some of the maps and uh, one of the previous visuals, Lot 8 and 9, which I understand are owned by the Knutson as well, and on, on the one visual we had up on the screen, it looked like some of the other buildings were setting on Lot 9, and then in the book... Uh, Lot six, it shows a deck, a house, a shed, a garage, and it almost looks like, uh, at least from that illustration, that setbacks may be a question on lot six. Is there anything that came up in this discussion about that? Um, not in the discussion, but those houses up there were built prior to 1984, so they'd be grandfathered in terms of their setbacks. But, but in terms of uh, that one illustration earlier. There's this one? Yeah. That one there looks, looks almost like the one house is sitting on parts of three lots. Yeah, and this is taken, this aerial is taken from Rapid Map, um, and up there, the lot, the lot lines, um, we say they're for entertainment purposes only on Rapid Map because um, it's really hilly, and the topography up there is such where the lines in Rapid Map are pretty far off up there. Um, so it does look like that, but from surveys and things like that that I've seen, it's close, but I don't think that they're actually on the other property. Well, I remember a deal we had in Silver City where there was an outhouse sitting on, on a lot line, and mm -hmm. uh, in this one diagram, it looks like that shed is really close. pretty much... A, that way too. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, just just a thought. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Are, are there any other comments or questions for Cassie? Uh, the applicants are here. Would you like to speak to this issue? My name is Janice Knudsen. Um, I am the agent for Bellwether Limited Partnership. Um, obviously, you know why we're here. I don't have to go through all those. I just want to address a couple of the things that Cassie mentioned. Um, number one, we were never asked or told by Rex Fackrell to apply for a conditional use permit. Rather, he said that he'd received a complaint and that he was obliged to send us a letter and that we could, the county, he had no problem with the county keeping our RV there for a couple nights of summer. That was in 2014. Then again, and, and he said we pr would probably get another letter. So we did get another letter the following year in July of 2015, and I tried to get a hold of Rex but uh, several times, but he had been transferred to another office. Then I talked to Cassie, and at the time, Cassie said that the county was okay with us having our RV up there for just a couple nights under the conditions that we were using it. The first time we were asked about the conditional use permit was in a letter, and I don't have the date of that letter, but that was, I believe, October of 2015. At the time, I told Cassie our RV wasn't up there, and we didn't think we were 
doing anything against anything at the time since it wasn't there. We were going to be out of town a lot, and so I didn't want to apply for a permit until spring. But then the um, letter, another letter came in November asking us to do so by January 29th, which we did immediately. So that is the history as far as we know it. Um, I just want to confirm about the alarm. We're not actually sure how that alarm goes out. We were t on or off, except that we were told by the guy that <coughs> Uh, developed a lot that it would go off when it was near full and so as Mr. Coleman stated it's not going to go off unless we're actually there using it or somebody else is using it they shouldn't be there otherwise um, yes that that shed has been an issue um, that Mr. Peterson referred to we do know about it um, it's been an issue we don't think it's a problem but um, it does show how much confusion there is according to the county and covenants in our area and has been ever since we've been owners. A couple more things. Um, we never intend to use this lot as a campground, never will. I don't think using our own RV on our lot and having family or a friend come up there to visit is anything different than what's happening on the other lots. We've seen other lots up there with ha people having company. So I guess that's what we call it. We don't call it a campground. We never intend to use it as a campground. If you've seen the lot, <laughs> it is not. It, it's just way too small to even use it as such. It's a gated community, so to speak, and that's enough said on that. Um, ingress, egress. Um, we don't think our RV adds any more danger to the situation that already exists. There's a, a, a garbage truck that comes in and out, a large garbage truck that empties a dumpster. Um, there, we have seen other RVs, other campers actually blocking the road. We've seen children driving four-wheelers on that road. They're not mature enough to know how to respond to an emergency vehicle. There's even a gate that the emergency vehicle has to go through. So as far as our RV adding to any more situation than there already is, we don't think it does. Um, secondly, property value is an eyesores. You've seen that in the letter. Um, I guess it all depends upon how you look at it. What you look at when you drive in could be a dumpster. You could see our RV up above on a corner. Yes, you can see it as you asked. Um, but we also see an outhouse, a dilapidated outhouse on our neighbor's property as we pass it. We see a logging splitting operation, kind of a mess with logs. We see junk on another lot. Um, we have seen other RVs and campers. So to selectively use our RV as an eyesore or detracting from property values is hard for us to understand. Um, I guess that's enough on that subject. Oh, I, I was also going to say, as far as ingress, egress, our RV is up there so infrequently. Last, there, last summer we were there four nights. So as far as adding to the traffic, it's, it's used very infrequently. Um, let's see. Um, there's also the concern that maybe our RV has detracted from property values. Well, indeed, we think we've improved the property value. I'm sure none of you know what this looked like when we bought it, but there was a half-built cabin. There were railroad ties. There were empty barrels. There was garbage. There were pails. The railroad ties were balanced on barrels very precariously. It was just full of junk even an outhouse. So I don't think, I think what we've done is improve the property value. We've also opened up a road um, to uh, enable other property owners access to two of the most beautiful trails in the area. We aren't concerned if they do that, and we think that also adds to property values. Um, lastly, The Grossenvers have listed or in, stated in their letter that they know of no other property owners who are in favor of our plan. Well, first of all, I don't think there's anything ever written anywhere that they have to be in favor of our plan, but we've had extensive conversations with our neighbors, and we've concluded, and you have some information there in front of you that says um, the overwhelming majority is not against our plan, and in fact, I think we've made it better place for them because now they can access the trails. So I'd be happy to address any questions if you have any. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Janice. Uh, does anyone have questions? Okay, I'd, I'd like to ask our attorney to make a statement. Thank you. <coughs> uh, 
<clears throat> Madam Chairman, members of the Commission, my name is Kurt Jensen, and I'm here on behalf of the Knutsons and their partnership, Bellwether. Um, I want to make just a few comments in it that Janice, I think, has articulated the the personal side of it, and there's a couple of legal issues that I just wanted to make sure that I could clear up, or hopefully. And uh, the first of all was the conception that the that the Knutsons are trying to create a campground. And when I read the objection and I read the application, I, it, it seemed like they were talking about two different things. Uh, there was no intention uh, to make any type of a commercial campground. Uh, of this lot. They have no intention to do that. It's for their personal use. So I think the, the objection was a mischaracterization um, uh, that I want to clear up and that it was mischaracterization to the neighbors, which is concerning because it clearly uh, asks, uh, suggests that this application is an attempt to put a commercial campground or a campground in the traditional sense, and it clearly is not and uh, no intention to do that, and the Knudsons themselves would be the first ones to object to a commercial campground in this area. Secondly, there was talks about the covenants. Uh, we do, I do not believe that, that they are a violation of the covenants. Uh, there's nothing in the covenants about RVs. There is about trailers, as that was noted. Um, a trailer for a, a, a living uh, facility. And ironically, there was a trailer on there that the Knutsons moved off as an old trailer. So, and of course, uh, covenants are a private matter, private contract, and it's not an issue that's before this, uh, this, uh, this body. Uh, secondly, um, your zoning ordinances do give a definition or example of a conditional use of an RV as a temporary living quarters, and I think this particular um, use does fit within that definition. Um, it's not allowed where there's other living quarters that exist, which is the case here. It has an approved wastewater. They want to use it for their own mobile home, not for the use of, of others other than a visitor like the other ones do. And not more than 180 days in any calendar year as part of your ordinance. They want to use it much less than that. They have no intention of living up there for 180 days and would accept conditions in that regard and, and the conditions that uh, this commission may wish to impose. So the, the special use permit that's, excuse me, conditional use permit that is asked for here is consistent with the intended use of this district as residential property. It's not commercial uh, use. And finally, your section 501D, I believe, has the factors to be considered in reviewing a conditional use permit. And um, the first factor that you look at is the effect upon the use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity and property values. I think Janice Knudsen spoke to that. I don't think I have anything more to add, though I cannot see any argument that anything they are doing on that property um, would diminish the value of the property. In fact, their use uh, over the years has improved the value of the property and everyone's in the neighborhood. The second one is, does this uh, proposed use affect the normal and ordinary development of the property in the area? I don't see anything with this use that would inhibit the use of the property or the development of other lots on the property by virtue of this very limited use for limited periods of time for personal use. The third factor they look at is what impact might there be on utilities, access, drainage, or other necessary facilities. Uh, there's no suggestion here that the use that's proposed, this conditional use, will have any impact on access, drainage, or other necessary um, facilities. The improvements that the Knutsons have put on have all been approved by the county. They've been expect, inspected on site. The fourth characteristic uh, factor that you look at is the, the effect the use might have on parking or unloading. Uh, clearly, that's not an issue in this particular uh, case. And finally, the final factor that is to be looked at is 
are there measures, necessary measures, that need to be taken to control of offensive noise, odor, fumes, dust, vibration, or lighting? Well, there's nothing, no suggestion that the intended use here would impact or cause any of those concerns that we sometimes have when you consider a conditional use permits. For these reasons, we would ask that the uh, conditional use permit with the restrictions that have been uh, suggested by planning uh, be approved by this commission. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Are there questions? No? Nope. Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes, <clears throat> Now, maybe I should ask this of the uh, <clears throat> Grossenbergs, but is your understanding is that they are opposed to any RV presence? Well, uh, they may be, and they, they can speak to that. Yeah. They, the way they characterized their, their objection that they submitted was they, they object to it as use as a campground, right. yeah. their characterization, not ours. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this issue? Yes, sir. Please come forward and identify yourself. This is Patsy Grossenberg. She's my wife, and my name is Mick Grossenberg. Uh, we were born and raised in Winter, South Dakota, and, and I practice law there. And Could you uh, swing the microphone a little bit closer? I'm sorry. I don't think the audience can hear you. And I practice law. I don't want to be. I practice law there uh, for 42 years and retired in uh, 2009. And we built our cabin on Lot 7. And in 1972, and the, year, the year of the flood. Yeah, we'll, we'll speak one at a time. So, <laughs> and then, <coughs> and uh, and we moved there full time six years ago. We've been there six and a half years. Um, my, I'm like I said, I'm a, a retired attorney, and I don't represent anybody here other than myself. Uh, my cousin, Gene Grossenberg, who's the John Deere dealer, you see those John Deere signs around, and, and the name's quite well known because of that. And I appreciate you uh, disclosing your, your visit with uh, his daughter. Um, he owns uh, Lot 6. And I think his garage is, uh, it might be built on Dr. Knutson's land <laughs> there. and. Uh, and, and my cousin, Gene Grossenberg, who's 85, 86 years old, 12 years older than I am, uh, it, what has been and is a patient of Dr. Knudsen. And I, and I have been a patient of Dr. Knudsen's, but I am no longer a patient. But my cousin advised us that he wants to remain neutral, and I respect that. Uh, for one reason, he, he built on, if he did build on Dr. Knudsen's lot, he better not be raising hell with Dr. Knudsen. <laughs> And he is a patient. I don't. How, how many of you folks have ever been up there in Mystic Valley? Okay, all of you except uh, the chairman. Well, I, let me. It, it's 85 acres of deeded land, and it started to be developed around 1969. There's one or two cabins. We were one of the first people up there, and there there are 18 cabins now that have been built. Two creeks come together, Rapid and Castle. And it's a gorgeous place. It's Mickelson Trail. Yeah, and the Mickelson Trail goes through. And, and uh, I've had people that have lived in the Black Hills uh, say that, in their opinion, it, it, it's more beautiful than Spearfish Canyon. And that might be stretching it, but it, it's uniquely beautiful. And it's a unique place. And it's not a place to have an RV. Some of these cabins are very, very nice, and some are very modest. And an RV is, uh, does, is not compatible with, with, with those 18 cabins that are up there. And there's very few undeveloped lots there. And we, and we would certainly don't want to see those undeveloped lots turn into RV pads or campgrounds, whatever the word. It's the same thing. Uh, and, and, and we think it's a shame that Dr. Knudsen is doing this, we think it's a desecration of our valley. I, I'm a little reluctant to say this, but it's like the, the unmentionable thing found in a, in a punch bowl at a nice party. And we, I, I really do believe it's a desecration of our valley. Now, 
I was being examined by Dr. Knudsen, I think in 2009, and he told me he was going to bring his R he's going to bring his RV up there. Well, I went home, and uh, and I wrote him a letter. Uh, we we have an old saying down there, practicing law, the the old homesteaders and stuff. A good neighbor is worth more than a good quarter of land, and I believe that. And I wanted to be a good neighbor and a friend, and I'm a, I'm a patient. I, I, I should have said, when I was in his office and he said he was going to do that, I should have said, over my dead body. And I regret to this day that I did not do that, and I did just the opposite. I did a stupid thing. I wrote and said, my wife and I have no objection. And, uh, and that was with, with the understanding that he was going to do that for a couple years until he decided what to build on his lot. In fact, he told me he was going to have John Crane design a deck and design his cabin for him. So I, I rationalized, my wife and I, that we could live with this for a couple of years. He's going to build. I, I don't want to offend him. I want to get along with him. And I, the, the last thing I wanted to happen is what has happened. Now we got a neighbor that we're fighting with, and that is miserable. Those old homesteaders knew about that. And fighting with your neighbor out in the country when there's only you're out there all alone, that's, that's miserable stuff. And I don't think we are the cause of the problem. I think that RV is the cause of the problem. Now, we, we, so we, we went along to get along. But two years went by, and now it's been six and a half years. In, in 2009, at our gate to the valley, there was a conditional use permit sign. And it was there for a while, and, and there was going to be a hearing in September of 2009, and my wife was going to go, she's the legal owner of our property, and, and, and object to the conditional use permit. And All of a sudden... Whose conditional use permit was this, It was this, the sir? Knudsen's. It was the first one. And now we're dealing with the second one. Uh, now, the hearing was set for September 2009, but it was canceled, and the, and the sign was withdrawn. And we, 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 we didn't know why. Uh, but things went on until 2014. And Knudsen's were using their property. I, I don't know if you can measure how much use they made of their property by how of, often they, they uh, have the sanitation truck come and empty. You, I think a more, if, uh, if you got their, their electrical records, you could show every time they used that property up there. And it, it isn't that frequently. It'd be uh, two days a month, you know, for two or three months. And, and, but then they started leaving it there for a couple weeks at a time. And we can see it from our property. And when you drive into our beautiful valley, you can see it from when you come around the corner, there it is up on the hill like a sore thumb. And you, if you're riding your bike or hiking down the trail, it's right up above you. And it is an eyesore. Now, we, we realized that this wasn't going to be for a couple of years, that the camel got his nose in the tent by saying we're going to build in two years, and now the camel wants in the tent. They want a permanent conditional use permit to use this as an RV pad, campground, whatever you will. And the camel wants to be in the tent. We made a, mis a mistake by letting the camel get his nose in the tent. Now, we stopped down to the planning office in July of 2014 and asked, I forget his name, the director happened to be out front, and, and asked, uh, well, what happened to that conditional use permit? And I think he looked it up on his computer and he, and he said, oh, we can't, the Pennington County cannot allow a, use, a conditional use permit in that subdivision. And we told those people we should have never accepted their application for one, and we told them we, we couldn't act on it because it's not allowable under the, the zoning laws. And he says, do you want to sign a complaint? We said, well, we looked at each other and we said yes, because we wanted to stop this. And um, so they sent the letter out. And it basically said, uh, cease and desist using your property as a campground, RV pad, whatever, your class A motorhome. And Knudsen's ignored that letter. They, from 2014 to 2015, they were up there doing that, even though they were told by 
this agency, by this administration, that they weren't supposed <coughs> to do that. They were thumbing their nose at you folks and at the law. They were above the law. They thought they were above the law. So a year later, not too long ago, July of 2015, we said they're back up there again, and they're doing it. And they send a second letter out. And uh, the Knutsons were, they, they ignored that letter. They were back. So we wrote a letter, well, this is the last fall now, and said we'd like to see something done about this, uh, a prosecution or something. And uh, lo and behold, Cassie writes us and, and says that the Knutsons are entitled to a conditional use <coughs> permit, may be entitled to a conditional use permit. Therefore, we're not going to prosecute. This was the, the essence of what, of, of what happened. Ironically, when you look at this, and, uh, the, the planning staff, uh, Pennington County Planning, uh, was on our side of the issue in 2014 and 2015. They said no RV can be used in this subdivision. It's just incompatible with the use of the subdivision. It was absolutely true. It is incompatible, undeniably, unarguably. There's no other one up there. No one else is doing this. And, and now, for some reason, when it came time to prosecute, uh, uh, they, the, the first two letters were written, and, and it was under rule of law. The law says you can't do this. Now we got something going on administratively. <coughs> somebody knows somebody or something. And we're not going to prosecute you, but uh, we'll, we can get you a conditional use permit. And here we are today. I don't know specifically what went on. I don't know who knows whom. I don't know what was said. I don't know why the staff is against our side of the issue today when they're absolutely for it two years ago, one year ago. So th that smells. That stinks. And that's not business under rule of law. That's business under who you are or who you know. And that should not be done. Now, we sent you folks, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to read it, our memorandum. And attached to that memorandum, there were uh, signed written statements by 17 property owners, including us, 16 not including us, saying that what was going on up there is not right, it's not compatible. Those are all very good people. And ethically, we sent a copy of that to Cassie, and we sent a copy of that to Knutson's. And uh, Knutson wrote a response, and we just saw it here a minute ago when we picked the packet up back there. And, it, <coughs> and he says he called some of these people, and they've retracted. Well, that's hearsay. These people are not stupid people. They're good people. We didn't, we didn't mislead them. Calling their place a campground is not misleading. That's exactly what it is. Two. My wife has two <laughs> RV hookups. And, and, and uh, those written signed objections by those 17 people, uh, th that, that should be a loud and clear statement to you folks that what the, the Knutsons are not loved up there for what they're doing. Uh, we want to be friends with the Knutsons. We want to get along. We want to be good neighbors. But we don't, we don't want that RV up there. And, and we can see it from our home. I, uh, there are other things I'd like to say, but I, I think I've, I've gotten it out. And I'll, I'll, after my wife gets a moment to speak, I hope I haven't taken too much of your time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Grossenberg. Well, we love the area. I mean, we've been there practically 45, we've had our cabin for practically 45 years. And now we feel so fortunate, so blessed to be able to live there permanently. And it, it's, it's, it's a very special place. And we're very protective of it, and we want it to stay that way forever. I mean, not just while we're there, but for generations to come. And if, if a conditional use permit lets them bring a camper in, others can do the same. And, and it, right now, I don't think there's anyone that would, that would want a camper in there that would put hookups in. But uh, we're in our 70s, and we know we can't live there for too much longer before our health gives out or something. So we sell our property, then somebody could, you know, put, a, put hookups 
or, or other cabin owners. At this time, I don't think there's anybody interested. But it's opening the door to that. And it's going to totally change the whole atmosphere. I mean, think about yourself. If there's a, a vacant lot next to you, and, and uh, all of a sudden there's hookups and a camper there, you know, it, it changes. It changes your neighborhood. OK. Thank you. Are there questions for the Grossenbergs? I have one question. Yes. I hate to use a hypothetical, but um, <clears throat> imagine that the Knudsen's go out and buy a used double wide without skirting that they can buy for probably very little money. They pull it in to satisfy the need for some kind of permanent structure, and they park their RV next to it. Now, that seems to me to be a circumstance that doesn't improve the property at all but it meets and complies with your requirements. Now, I, you know, it seems to me there ought to be some ground that can be found here, because my understanding is that the Knudsen's property is well-maintained. You've confirmed that yourself, really, that they have, that the, the uh, RV is not an eyesore by any stretch. And so what I'm saying, basically, is it could be so much worse. In addition, this is high-value property. This is not property that's going to much farther into the future be, you know, property for an RV. There's a distinct possibility with those kind of locations, and I know exactly where you are, that, that there's going to be a permanent structure built there because people don't put RVs for long extended periods of time on pieces of property that are very expensive and very desirable. So I, I think you're fighting a battle here that Unfortunately, I wish you weren't. Um, and I know you're trying to find some accommodation, but I just think that there ought to be a way that you could accept, at least for the moment, um, the presence of their RV with the realization that that is not going to be a permanent circumstance, at least from my perspective. Yeah. Well, <coughs> that, that's what we tried. It's in the minutes that say they would do it for a year or two. Everybody up there that signed these statements know that that's what they said. And, and, and uh, we all went along to get along. Now you're asking us to do that again six years later, to keep going, going along to get along. Uh, the, the covenants, and I know you don't enforce those, but they, they tell you what the community is supposed to exist of. All three different sets, because there were stages of development, say there shall be exclusively used uh, for cabins and residences. Not, it doesn't say RVs. And these folks know that. I, in the letter I wrote Dr. Knudsen, I says, please look at your covenants. I can't speak for other people in the valley. And uh, I, I really was trying to be tactful. Instead of saying over my dead body, I was trying to be tactful. And I thought there's no way in the world this man would use this expensive property for an RV pad, for a campground. And that's exactly what he did. <coughs> and then you're asking, and we tolerated that, and it's gone on for six and a half years. And, 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 and in view of these facts, he thumbed his nose at the cease and desist letters, and he ignores the covenant and says, I'm, I'm a team player. If he's a team player, he would honor those covenants. He wouldn't be here today trying to sneak in the back door to get a conditional use permit when he was told twice that he could not have one before. Well, to me, it feels like we've been duped, that, that we, you know, they knew that they weren't supposed to be bringing a, a camper in there. I mean, Mick wrote him a letter saying that that's, check your covenants. You're not supposed to be bringing a camper in here, but we wanted to be neighbors. We wanted to get along. And, and we trusted, we trusted that 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 it was just going to be temporary. That what the sewer system they were putting in, and that would be for a cabin someday. But then the realization: there's two hookups here. Not only are they bringing in their camper, but another camper, and it's just, it's just. And now, like Mick said, it's gone on, and it's not. And and as far as our covenants say. It has to be, there are restrictions of what you can build, and you can't bring a, you know, can't have a shack, you can't, uh, you said a dilapidated double wide. Well, that's against our covenants, and if we have to sue through 
I mean, we may have to do that, but well, for, for what Mrs. they- Mrs. Grossenberg, I, we don't enforce covenants in the I know county, that. so I know the, that. the issues with covenants really don't belong in this discussion. Well, well, we only but, point that out to show that they're not acting in good faith. Because they knew about the covenants, they did know. No, I told them that. Right. <coughs> That's the point, and we're not asking. Uh, well, thank you for your consideration. Are there any other questions for the Grossenbergs? Well, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, whether all the other property owners uh, abide by all the covenants of your homeowners association. Well, you're talking apples and oranges. Some are egregious. This is egregious. Covenants are covenants, though, yeah. really. Uh, I, I can't. Uh, I, I'm not the policeman up there like Dr. Knudsen thinks I am. We use good faith, try to get along, and... and in, in, in fact... And we're being used. In fact, they mentioned their son's condition, and, and so they came to us when they were, when they were going to do building and, and asked because they didn't have an address and they wanted a phone. And so we gave them permission to use our address to put a phone in. We tried very hard. <coughs> well, it, like, like yes, it, Commissioner? It is, it's a miserable situation. And I think it's time for it to end. One of, one of the things that I think of on occasions like this, and the question I have is, how far away do I have a right to control what someone else does on their property? I'm not trying to do that, sir. I want, oh, did I interrupted you, excuse me. No, well, I wanted you to speak into the microphone. Oh, no, no one has specifically ever answered my question. You should, I, 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 you can use your property as long as it doesn't interfere with the right to me use my property. But when you bring that RV up there and I'm gonna show no. my, my cabin to someone who wants to buy it and he sees that up there. It devalues our property. Well, just, just show it when, when he's not there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'd be dishonest. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very questions? much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this issue? Thank you. Can I make one comment? Yes. Um, I don't know if it matters, but we don't know what the RV looks like. I mean, I, I personally think RVs are extremely ugly. And I know that when people park them in our neighborhoods, when they have people to come visit and they park them on the curb for a few days, I don't like looking at them. But, you know, and I don't like camping, and I don't like anything like that. I would rather go stay in a beautiful cabin in your beautiful area. But that's my personal opinion of what an RV looks like. There are some extremely expensive RVs that look a lot nicer than some people's houses. <laughs> and to me, that's a, what I'm trying to point out is that's a judgment. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I wouldn't want to look at an RV either, but I also wouldn't want to look at a junky building. So I think that's a consideration. <coughs> yes, would anyone else like to speak? Ms. Knudsen? Very quickly, um, our RV is a 2005 model RV. Um, our recollection is, is that we paid $105,000 for it. I don't know how to, I should have brought a picture, but I think most people would say it's in nearly new condition if that helps. But it looks like a bus, right? Yeah, it does look like yes, a bus. You're absolutely right. It's ugly. You are absolutely right. In my that's opinion, your, yeah, it's, an ugly, I, it's an ugly camper. I understand. But that's um, my opinion. Yeah, I, and I'm not offended by that. I guess I ask um, the question of why, why is it okay for Grossenbergs to have a camper in their driveway? It's either resting on top of their pickup or on sawhorses during the summer, we've seen it when we've been there consistently. That would be a question I would have. Um, secondly, I wanna note that Mrs. Grossenberg said we are right next to them. We are two lots away and up the hill. Um, as far as applying for the conditional use permit, we have to admit that our memory is foggy. This was way back in 2009. We were not aware that there were any covenants and or codes. Everything was inspected and permitted. We did not know until 2009, after we had spent a lot of money developing and using our lot, 
that there were covenants, and covenants aren't the issue, but I do want to make it known that we did commit to the Homeowners Association at a meeting when we found out about those covenants in 2009 that we would not leave our RV there longer than two weeks at a time, which we have not done. Um, and it said, until we decide, in the minutes it says, until we decide on our building plans, you all have a letter in front of you that describes why we didn't build at a certain time, and I'm not going to get into those details. Um, I guess I don't, I have a feeling like it kind of looks like we've duped the Grossenbergs when in fact we were not aware of the covenants, we were not aware of the codes, we did respond immediately to the county's letters and we're told it was okay to have our RV up there and when we were asked to get a conditional use permit, we did. Um, the reason there are two hookups up there is because we wanted a friend and or our kids to be able to come up there and be with us and to use that lot responsibly not to use the outdoors as a bathroom. And so that's the only reason there are two hookups. They're the kind of one on one post, but there are two hookups. And we hope to have our kids build there someday. In fact, they're very interested in doing so, but are not at a point in their life that they can do so. As Mr. Coleman suggested, they may very likely build a cabin up there. So I'm done, thank you. Thank can, you. can I ask you a question? <coughs> so when you have two up there, do you have two buses? We have one camp. We've had one camper, what? and one bus. Okay, what's the what's the camper? What's the difference between a trailer that you pull behind a car? Okay, and then ours looks like a bus. So then you have like a pop up camper. Or so a there camper has on the been one pop cup pop up camper up there on on one occasion. Those people never come anymore because the fellow died. Um, and then another time, there has been another trailer that has been pulled up there and sat there for two nights. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, briefly. After my appointment with Dr. Knudsen, I went home and wrote the letter the next day, and I said, look at your title insurance. There are covenants in that. And I says, if you want to ask me about those, call me, and I'll be happy to discuss them with you. They knew that from before they developed the lots. So that's not true at all. Okay, thank you. And then one, one more point. They purchased two condominiums in Naples, Florida within the last few years instead of building a cabin when they said they were going to. So whatever that's worth. I don't believe that we really can fault them for how they spend their money. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kinsley, would you please explain to us the difference in the interpretation of the conditional use permit, permit applicability Well, can I, Madam Chair? Yes. I, I think part of the um, part of the explanation to that is that the staff changed. I mean, the director changed, the assistant director changed, the interpretations changed, and you know, Mr. Grossenberg is questioning. I think the credibility of the staff, and I think that's an explanation because of the staff changes. But that would be my only comment on that. Yeah. One of my questions is when the original interpretation was made by Mr. Jennison back in. 2009 or whenever it was. Did he consult the state's attorney's office, do you know? Kinsley grew up from the state's attorney's office. Um, I have no idea about that one. I know that, um, I think there had been a file that Patrick Grody, my predecessor, worked on before that, but I don't know the whole history of how he consulted with Dan on all of that. I just know that when Cassie came to me with a question, because I was new, starting, Oh, what, a year and a half ago? And so when she came to the question with me, we looked through the zoning ordinance and we um, parsed out what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. So we went with the interpretation um, that I guess we came to together on, you know, talked it over, all of that. And I think I probably talked it over with Jay Alderman as well. So we did everything f fresh um, and there was nothing... Nothing at all. I mean, I don't know anyone personally. I have no idea who the Grossenborgs or the Knutsons are. So nothing was, no decisions were made based upon any personalities or any people or any influence at all like that. And yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, Commissioner Litson has that right, that basically there might have been a staff change that influenced 
um, something, and it could have been that um, the, the actual question as to whether they could apply for a conditional use permit was never actually asked of the state's attorney's office, and the only thing that was ever sent up was the fact that they were um, using an RV as a temporary residence for the time, and so maybe the state's attorney's office should pursue a violation, but I don't know if the question was actually asked whether or not they could get a conditional use permit for it, because if I would have been doing it back then, I would have had the same interpretation that I think it fits within um, that, the things that could be conditionally permitted in that <coughs> zoning district, and so that's why they have the opportunity to come apply for it. So. If it was up to me, I would have said the same thing back then as I did now. But yeah, I, th I think it probably was a matter of staff changes. And I think that too, the, the original interpretation or opinion was a kind of off the cuff. Yeah, it looks okay. You know, between mm -hmm. Dan, the prior director, and the compliance person, you know, they were like, oh, you're only using a few weeks, I don't have a problem. Yeah. You know, without consulting mm -hmm. and getting a, an official legal opinion of what should be done under the ordinance. It, right. Could definitely have been that. <coughs> so I think, you know, those things are different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kinsley. Is anyone else here who would like to speak to this issue? Is there any discussion? If not, would someone like to make a motion? Cassie. Can I just make a, a point of clarification? Just sure. listening to the um, some of the comments that have been made, I do want to clarify that this conditional use permit is to use this RV as living quarters. Um, if they were to just store the RV on the property, not hooked up to anything, um, we would not be able to, under our zoning ordinance, tell them that they had to remove it. Um, so this pertains to them actually utilizing it on the property, storing RVs on the property is something that is allowed in our county. Um, and the only time that we regulate it is if it is prohibiting safety, welfare, or anything like that of people. So if they're parked in the right of way in the middle of the road and stuff like that, that's when we regulate them. But if they were to just store this RV on their property, they wouldn't need a conditional use permit and we likely would not regulate it. Can so I ask they, a question? Yes, Lori. So I, again, I don't have the conditions in front of me because I can't get my stupid PC to work, but um, what is the time frame that they're allowed to use the vehicle on the property? Um, there are conditions in there. They are allowed to use it May through September of each year. Um, yeah. There is conditions in there as well that if it is not in use, um, it if, if it is in fact just being stored on the property, it is to be completely disconnected from anything. Um, there are also conditions in there um, that it cannot be, if it is stored outside of the months of May through September on the property, that it cannot be occupied by any person's for any length of time during those months. Yes. yes. So they can bring it up in May. They don't have to live there continuously between May and September, and then they get to haul it out in September? That, that's how it's going to work? Well, um, if I mean, under the conditions, there is the way that they could store it on the property outside of the months of May through September, but it is not to be used or occupied by any persons for the way it's worded is for overnight accommodations or living quarters for any period of time outside those months. So they could store it on their property. It's uh, got to be disconnected. Yes, it has to be completely disconnected if it's not in use. Okay. But, but all they would have to do is disconnect it and the Grossenbergs would have to look at it all year. From May through September. Yes, it could be stored on the property completely disconnected. They put more than one on the property? Well, it's two. It says they can have two at the okay, same time. So they time. could move two up there and leave them all year round. Yes, um, I'm not aware, PJ, correct me if I'm wrong, of anywhere in our zoning ordinance that limits how many RVs can be stored on a property. But the Knudsons don't plan to do this. They say they're going to Remove. only use it, and they take the motor home and return it to their home in Rapid City. Yes, yeah. it's my understanding that they bring it up and remove it each time they're done, that it's, yeah. yeah. Because maybe we should put a condition in there that makes that clearer because personally, I wouldn't want to look at an RV from May through September, whether someone's living there or not. I mean, personal opinion again, no offense. Yeah, I mean, um, Ms. Knutson, thank you, Cassie. <clears throat> we would certainly <coughs> be willing to allow 
that condition that you're speaking of. Um, we Historically, we've used it at the most six nights a summer. Okay. I guess to cover our behinds, I'd like to say 20. Um, but but, we, you, but, but you bring it and right. take it back. And we've committed, please remember, we've committed, and this I know you don't get into covenants, but we have committed to our association that we will never leave it there more than two weeks at a time. Uh, I guess I'd like to see a condition like that in, in sure. the We'd conditional certainly use be willing to that. Good. No, no problem with that. But the other thing is, please remember that one, our, our family needs to be mobile because of our son. Um, we have to, it's easier to have an RV at this point in our life because we can take it home, we can unpack it, we can clean it. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't like to leave it up there. In fact, we'd never leave it up there hooked up. We don't want to leave it up there hooked up because what if the electricity goes out? Yeah. Then you've got a mess in your refrigerator. So there are other things that because of the RV the way it is, it's, it's mobile. So you would accept a condition in the conditional use permit that does not allow for it being there for a period of more than two weeks at a time. Absolutely. And you would accept a condition that says you will not store RVs on the property. Absol Absolutely. Yes. We don't want to store it up there. We are not supposed to I, I mean, that's giving you more control than the ordinance gives us. Actually, right. yeah, whatever. I mean, we're, we're fine with that. We have tried to work this out. We really would like to work it out. So, Does the staff any, have any comment on those conditions? Um, PJ and I were just talking it over. Um, my recommendation would be that we change condition number one to say that a recreational vehicle may be used as utilized as living quarters on the property only during the months of May through September of each calendar year and for no more than two weeks at a time. Um, and then change condition number three simply to state that a recreational vehicle may not be stored on the property. Yeah, outside of the months of May through September. Well, no. Or do you want it to no. just say that it cannot be It may be stored. not be stored on the property at all. Yeah, because the Cause condition. Because it's more restrictive then. Well, and yeah, and the condition right above it states that if it is stored on the property, it cannot be disconnected. So that kind of controls the, the definition of being stored. Yes. Do we? Do any commissioners have comments about that? Those? I think that uh, gives uh, the Grossenberg some, must give them some satisfaction, I would hope, that. Uh, and that seems reasonable to me. I think the Knutsons are bending over a little bit here because by accepting those conditions, I would so move if that's what Cassie's writing down there. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what I just said. <laughs> okay, the, the two is, weeks. And the, uh, so this is, is this your motion, Jim? To approve conditional use permit CU 15-39 with 13 conditions, the first condition amended to say that a recreational vehicle, RV, may be utilized as living quarters on the property only during the months of May through September of each calendar year and for no more than two weeks at a time. Use of an RV as temporary living quarters on the subject property outside of the stated months shall result in automatic revo revocation of conditional use permit CU 15-39. And the second condition to read that if a recreational vehicle, RV, is stored on the property at any time when not in use, it must be disconnected from all utilities, including septic water and e electricity, and it may not be stored on the property. The other I conditions. Think it, I think it has to be that, if a rec that a recreational RV may not be stored on the property. I can't you just make that statement and just say it may not be stored on the property? And that's one sentence. Well, the, the assumption is it has to be in use somehow, which means it's connected. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if you just say that an RV may not be stored on the property, then although if it's on the property for two weeks and not in use, they'll just disconnect it while they're oh, not there. Okay. okay. So I, understand. I think you have to have both. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what I okay. was thinking. So that's the motion. Has a, is there a second? I'll second. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. <laughs> I don't know if I should go through this whole thing again. To approve conditional use permit CU 15-39 with 13 conditions as amended. 
the first condition adding, and for no more than two weeks at a time, and the second uh, condition amended to include and may not be stored on the property. Is there further discussion? Madam Chair Chairman, yes. I'm gonna recuse myself from the vote on this, simply because I know one of the parties better than a okay. thoroughly impartial person should, but anyway. All right, uh, the motion is on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yeah. On to item number 12. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Mm. County Board Report. <clears throat> County Board Report, item 12. Construction permit 1517 for Kroll Ready Mix Incorporated was appealed and will be heard on Wednesday, March 2nd, 2016 at 4 p.m. in the Commissioner's Meeting Room, this room here. Uh, no other items from the February 8th, 2016 Planning Commission meeting needed to be heard by the Board of Commissioners. I'm so sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> <coughs> item 13, items from the public. Uh, looks like all of our public is gone. Okay. Items no, from. Right. Well, I thought Joyce said she had something she wanted to oh, mention, okay. but I'm not yeah, sure. She took off with those guys. She's talking with um, them out there. Yep. We can come back to items from the public if that's all right. Do I have to amend the agenda? Well, she might want to comment on the next thing. Okay. <laughs> oh yes. Uh, would somebody like to go get her? That's what we were talking about. Since we have a law, just Thanks, wanted Brittany. to, I, I can clarify something for Commissioner Peterson where you had mentioned that shed that was close to the lot line on lot six, like the Donahue one in Silver City. Um, it does appear that it's either on it or close to it. The way our office operates is, unless it's immediately affected or has to do with what we're working on, we don't police it, we don't go after it. Otherwise we'd be, that's all we'd be doing. And since it only had to do with lot 11, <laughs> We noted it, we know it's there. When lot six comes in to do something, it will be addressed. Okay. Oh, but thank, thank you for your comment. Nothing? Okay. She didn't have anything? Okay. Uh, items from the staff, um, vacation home rental. Sure. Uh, item A, vacation home rental ordinance update. Uh, essentially what happened, where we are right now, is the Board of Commissioners uh, looked at the draft that's been approved by the committee and recommended a couple different things for us to do um, based on recommendation or approved some things that are based on recommendations from the ordin the ordinance amendment committee which was to have one additional advertising of this to go public and all the three newspapers in addition to the other advertisings that will happen when it becomes an official ordinance amendment once we apply for it in addition to that we're good to hold one public meeting, probably in this room. Uh, the dates for all of that still up in the air because we have a few key committee members that will be on vacation and we're trying to work around that. A couple of the key differences that they've approved as a committee uh, with a five to one vote is that they wanna put it into suburban residential uh, that reviews upon transfer of a conditional use permit for vacation rental only occur after one year of use and I think that's pretty much the biggest, those are the biggest ones. Okay, so they're, they would like us to conduct some public, one, at least one public meeting as the planning commission? No, no, it would be uh, myself working with uh, their committee, well, Charlie basically, and coming up with a, a public hearing at, so that people or can come that in. group for the vacation yes. home rental committee? Yes, yes. And then if there are any major changes that need to occur after that, the committee will meet again talk about those changes approval, but if there aren't any changes, it will then be, will actually file for an ordinance amendment, and then you will hear the, the result. Okay. Okay, is that clear? Any questions about vacation home rentals? Joyce, did you have anything to add? Okay. One a, a additional item that's not on there. If you noticed on the 2016 staff reports, the format has changed again. So if you have, we're just trying to make it a little clearer so that during the meetings, if you have something specific you wanna call out, you can make it, you can call out faster. So, but we'll see how it goes for a while. If you don't like it, it's okay, we can change it back. We're just trying to make it more user-friendly and. Gotcha, right. thanks. You're welcome. Uh, items from the membership, does anybody have anything? Hearing none, chair would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. It's been moved and seconded that to adjourn the meeting. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, we are adjourned. Thank you.